I've got um, seven main points to convey in 25 minutes. I don't know the following. Firstly, that all existence is movement, process velocity, as it's known. Secondly, that language is extremely useful because it's extremely misleading. Thirdly, that the, the understanding has evolved for practicality or power rather than for knowledge. Fourthly, and controversially from, from Bergson, Paul Bergson, the brain does not produce the mind despite the neural correlative consciousness. Fifthly, that the observer is the observed, that subject and object partially one. Sixthly, that the mind is ubiquitous, panpsychism, that all is mind. And seventhly, that the fundamental reality is pure creativity, real time, pure consciousness, which drives evolution and art, and that this can be intuited through psychedelic intake. So the psychedelic aspect will really come at the end of this uh, after I've introduced the uh, context in which it might make sense. Okay, so 25 minutes for quite a lot, so I'm going to be faster, I apologize for my speed. Um, as a preamble, I should say this Henri Bergson was a French philosopher, if you've never heard of him. He was a Nobel laureate and a much celebrated thinker of his time. He died in 1941. Aldous Huxley, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with his um, book, The Doors of Perception. Within that book, he actually employed Bergson's philosophy to some extent to explain his masculine experiences. So I'm going to sort of continue that a little bit. Um, Arthur Schopenhauer was a German philosopher. Um, he bridged Kant and Nietzsche. He was somewhat neglected in his time due to the prevalence of Hegel, who then influenced Marx. Um, he died in 1860, dying a year after Bergson was born, and a year after Darwin's Origin of Species published. And although Schopenhauer and Bergson differ on many points, they also cohere on a number of them, uh, which should be fruitful to our talk. I'll, I'll try to fuse our thinking to some extent uh, with a few additions from human nature. Um, 25 minutes, I should say, so five minutes Q&A at the end. Okay, so firstly, first point, process philosophy. Um, process philosophy is a term addressed retrospectively to Bergson, and notably to Alfred North Whitehead, um, who explicitly borrowed his ideas from Bergson. Process philosophy from Bergson is the idea that if we consider any so-called so object, like a table or a chair or whatever, um, we realize that it has no absolute definite boundaries in time or space. For example, um, a mushroom, say, um, the word mushroom constantly, if you really consider it and experience it, changes its form. Um, it's in fact one with its mycelia, its roots, um, which in turn is one with the nutrients uh, that the mycelium gathers from the substratum, etc. Uh, there's no absolute boundary between a mushroom and its environment, in other words. Even with more durable objects, um, if we accelerated time, as it were, and saw them over eras, we would see mountains fluctuate like waves in the ocean. So there are no, for Bergson, there are no permanent things whatsoever. Contrary, where so-called um, atoms and molecule, molecules also fluctuate, of course, in quantum physics, shadowing uh, Bergson's premeditation. So the first absolute point which you can write books about is that um, there are no absolute things. He does elaborate on that a lot. Secondly, that language is extremely useful because it's extremely misleading and that the understanding has evolved practicality rather than knowledge. For Bergson, it's language, more specifically words or symbols, which cut out of the fluidity that is reality isolated things. And by language, I, I include logic and mathematics. This isolating process, differentiation, serves human species very well. Um, in order to predict the future and to create tools and technology for our survival and development, we need to assume that there are stable things so that we can put them into a model and apply these, to these things stable laws or constants and expect from these practical results. And although this method of extraction and uh, hypostatization, solidifying uh, words into things, yields the produce of science, like you know, medicine, weapons, so on, we must realize that this natural human method is merely a model of reality. It's not reality itself. Both Bergson and Nietzsche stated, through divergent lines of thought, we're all inbuilt Platonists. Um, we mistake concepts for reality. Plato believed there were 
forms which exist in metaphysics, they all uh, really refer to actual entities um, existing outside of space and time. Uh, this is a natural bent of our human minds, I have some We're especially prone to geometry, making fluid reality um, mistaken for reality for the motion of stable things in geometric space. In reality, the crucial point, things and space are one entity. Everything is movement, change, becoming. Not things moving in time. Um, it's difficult, of course, for us to think this way because, as I said, our Bergson argues we've evolved to think in this way. But um, for it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to think that um, difficult to think that movement exists without things moving, without things moving, as it were, in, in movement. Like we think of waves moving, but of course water is moving within waves. But that's simply a result of our mode of thought. Um, electromagnetism <coughs> doesn't move in anything. People used to believe it moved in ether. The ether, that theory was abandoned, um, um, which led to Einstein's theory, Spider Maxwell, of course. Now, the most dangerous effect of mistaking isolated stable things is, according to this person, the mistake of spatializing time. In other words, we think of time as a line, um, a spatial line, as an independent variable, independent of the things in the model moving in the line, um, which can be divided, this timeline can be divided ad infinitum into instance t1, t2. But, Bergson argues there can be no instance in reality, because if they had no length of duration, they would not move, time would not move. And he says in physics, you know, there's no real speed of time. It's, speed of time is really um, irrelevant. And it's dangerous because time is real, not spatial. Um, and believing that thinking of time as spatial leads to materialism and determinism, which was dangerous for Bergson because he thought they were false views of reality. In summary, then, of this part, there can be no instance, a mistake due to the spatializing and division of such spatialized time. There can be no things, a mistake due to isolating repetitive movements away from the continuations. And also, there can be no known laws of nature, constants of nature, um, due partly to Hume's problem of induction. Um, the natural belief that the unobserved resembles the observed, which is a non fruitful axiom, of course, that the future will resemble the past. For Bergson, Reality is creative. It, it creates a new, but we think um, well, it's very useful to look back in time and sort of isolate repetitive behaviours and think they are constants. Again, Platonism, you know, that there are, con you know, the, there are laws of nature, constants of nature, which don't change, which have always been the same. We just have to discover what they are, and when we've got that, we can predict the future. Again, very useful, but it's based on a model of reality rather than reality itself. Therefore, we must acknowledge that our understanding has evolved for practicality rather than for pure knowledge. We must understand that illusion serves as well. And we understand that other creatures will have their own modes of thought useful for, for them. Their realities thereby no doubt differing widely from ours. As Nagel asks, what is it like to be an actor? This preamble leads to the fourth point now, which is the most controversial point for, for Bergson and what got him a lot of critics. The brain does not produce the mind, despite the neural correlates of consciousness. Um, so, due to our natural bent of thought, we think of um, we're inclined to reduce all phenomena, all experiences, to things moving in time, rather than the reality of pure movement. This is then um, materialism or mechanism. So. When addressed with the phenomenon of consciousness, it seems natural to reduce material things in the variable of time. But more specifically, um, consciousness is produced to reduce to neurons firing impulses and molecules to one another within the brain. This error of confusing the model for reality is further entrenched within the modern mindset due to the additional error of confusing correlation for sufficient cause for your identity. So, it is believed that because consciousness is correlated brain activity, in brain scans or in brain damage, you know, we, we leave parts of our consciousness and so on, uh, the brain therefore must either sufficiently totally cause consciousness, which is known as epiphenomenalism, 
Thank you, phenomenal, there's so much to say. Or um, the identical consciousness, identical theory, um, the so-called neural correlates of consciousness. But from correlation of brain to mind, brain to consciousness, um, from this identity is a, a non second because he gives a good, a, a nice analogy between um, the brain and the mind and the radio and the program is playing, like the news, for example. He says um, there's a perfect correlation between the radio set and the program it's playing. Let's say the BBC News. Change the radio circuitry, and you'll change the perceiving of the program, of course. One can even predict or read the program from investigating the radio circuitry. But of course, this perfect correlation between the program and what's going on inside the radio um, does not imply that the radio sufficiently, totally, causes the program. We don't say that our little radio sets cause the BBC News. Of course, it has another source in the BBC headquarters. Um, neither does the perfect correlation imply that the radio is identical to the program. Rather than say that BBC News is the radio. In fact, in this case, the radio merely picks up and translates the program, which has its source elsewhere. And this is analogous to the ultimate Bergsonian view. The argument then seeks to, sh to show that the mind is not necessarily brain or caused by the brain. Another old but recently revived argument shows that the mind cannot be sufficiently understood by examining the brain, and that's known as the hard problem of consciousness. It's an old philosophical uh, doctrine, but it's been revived by David Chalmers about 15 years ago. Moving on to the fifth point, um, that the observer is the observed. And this leads on to the psychedelic aspect. That subject and object are partially one. So if the brain is uh, not the mind, what is? Bergson employs this process philosophy that all is process becoming movement change and argues that the perception we have of something is actually a part of that something, as well as a part of oneself. There's a continual, uninterrupted flow. For example, consider looking at a star. If we trace the actual elements involved in this process, looking at a star, we understand that electromagnetic waves, light, of a certain frequency move towards us, this light then transforming, um, transforming through the eye's lenses, hitting the retina, transposing into an ionic pulse, through the optic nerve and back to the occipital lobe, um, there, there are continuing to virtual possible body actions by the whole nervous system, etc. Now, the words star, eyes, brain, nervous system, and so on, seemingly present these concepts as isolated parts which may interact with each other. The reality is, Bergson argues, that they're all one system with artificial cuts, which words especially sort of solidify for us. Necessary, again, for utility, but not reality. There's no actual distinction, he argues, between the eye, the brain, the nervous system. So why isolate consciousness as an artificially created part of the entire flow of the brain itself? Furthermore, why isolate the eye from that which it perceives? The eye and the electromagnetic frequency it redirects are part of one process again. And the electromagnetic frequencies are part of the star from which they emanate. Again, there being no absolute distinction. In other words, the observer is the observed. So when I look at a star, um, that perception I have is actually both part of me, and that's a word, of course, and part of the star, that being the word. It all being one process of which we artificially delineate into our brain as, as if the neurons in our brain sort of create a representation of the light from without. That part of the star is my perception of it. Um, is a part that evolution has extracted for the practical purpose of me, the human. So in other words, both said, what we see is what's, what has been useful for our survival and progress. Um, of course, we don't see much of reality. You know this, you know, we, we only see a fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum, for example. If one damages or alters part of the brain, part of the process is altered. So concomitant alteration of mind will ensue. But likewise, alter the process elsewhere, outside the body, for example, cut the emanating light with the cloud, and consciousness will, will also change. And the interesting thing is this, if we scan the brain during the stargazing session, one would expect to find, in Bergson's hypothesis, one would expect to find a perfect correlation between the neural correlates and the reported vision of the star. Um, according to Bergson's hypothesis, that the brain does not produce consciousness. 
But for Bergson, it's, the brain is merely a center for the redirection of incoming signals, frequencies, to potential bodily actions. So again, just because we have a perfect correlation between the brain and reported images does not logically imply that the brain produces those images, although it's just deemed to be so by default. The purpose of the brain is to, to direct incoming data, um, to, to sort of guide possible movements, um, which gives a power over our environment. Um, it's not to produce consciousness, but only to streamline it to practical considerations. And Nietzsche here being in accord with Bergson. Furthermore, the Bergson states all perception includes memory. For instance, to see the color of an object involves contracting innumerable waves into one, into a present. Um, therefore, consciousness for Bergson is essentially memory, because there can be no consciousness without a contraction of the past. So there is no present, really. All of the present that you see around you now, you're contracting billions and billions of light waves uh, into fractions of seconds, and less than that. So perception itself is an aspect of memory. And uh, as the brain doesn't produce consciousness per se, memory is metaphysical. Memory, for Bergson, is a spiritual substance, as it were. For Bergson, the past always exists in its entirety. It's the brain that limits its recollection to practicalities and brain damage that limits its reception. So brain damage which alters memory simply means we can't receive that memory somehow. Um, in dreams, Bergson writes, when the mind is not immediately preoccupied with its physical environment, the past is more open to revelation. Which leads us on to the second Second to last point, another point that the mind is ubiquitous or panpsychism, um, that the mind is everything. How are we doing for time? Five minutes? Okay. Okay, right. I'll be quick. Um, so if the brain is not sufficiently responsible for consciousness, and it's only the inbuilt Platonism of our understanding that lets it seem that it is, but yet that consciousness exists, then the implication is that this flow, this movement, this becoming is that is pure reality is itself a form of consciousness, which is memory. So the movement that, I, that both of us spoke about comes back to later and says that itself is, is a form of consciousness, not human consciousness, um, because as, as I say, we, we limit our consciousness to practical considerations, but nonetheless, a form of subjectivity. Um, this is known, if everything then is a form of consciousness, this is known as panpsychism, that mind is in everything. Um, this is accepted by both Bergson and Schopenhauer. The difference between them is that Bergson thinks consciousness or subjectivity is ubiquitous only throughout life, whereas Schopenhauer argues that subjectivity is ubiquitous throughout everything, including stars and molecules. So all what everything that we name matter and has a certain mind, not a sort of everyday human consciousness, obviously, but some kind of um, for Schopenhauer was a will, a, a desire. Not that they believe, for example, a table to be conscious. Um, Bergson, as I said, confines it to life, and uh, Schopenhauer confines it to home on self-organizing system. So the molecules within the table are a self-organizing system which would have a certain uh, subjectivity. But well, that's an artificially created thing, as it were, so it wouldn't. Um, a plant for Schopenhauer has a subjectivity that's probably confined to basic feelings of desire, for nutrition, sunlight, and so on. Uh, lack of neurons, again, does not logically imply lack of subjectivity. Just like lack of stomach doesn't imply lack of digestion. For both, ultimate reality is one which we participate in as individuals according to our purposes of our practical wills. Then. Um, for Schopenhauer, it was the will to survive. For Nietzsche, his successor in a way, the will to power. And for Bergson, Bergson really seems to be more important than the latter. So, final point. Fundamental reality of pure creativity, which drives evolution and art, and that this can be intuited through psychedelic intake. Um, this, so we've got a practical bent to isolate, to, to take from the, the flux of reality, isolated things, which again, very useful, um, language and science very useful, of course. Um, but Bergson says, there is another means to gain knowledge, which is intuition, as opposed to intellect. And um, he says, very difficult, of course, to, uh, to experience this intuition because it goes completely against our evolutionary bent, but nonetheless it is with an effort uh, possible. And um, by 
by getting into this intuition, he says, you can gain m many more forms of knowledge because you're not uh, biased by a natural mode of thinking. In fact, Burton's philosophy itself can be seen as a result of intuition. Now, by subduing the mechanism of our nervous system, then, um, psychedelics seem to be a route of entering, entering this state of intuition, um, uniting with the absolute consciousness by disassociating from the practical will of the body, like a drop of water entering the ocean, returning to its source. Often, of course, with psychedelics, this is mixed with um, intellectual faculties, um, as the intake is not complete shutdown of the body. Um, in fact, from this perspective, psychedelic experience could be considered as a temporary or partial death. Furthermore, as the psychedelic molecules quell our normal nervous system operations, as modern, modern neuroscience seems to sanction, at least with psilocybin, it's possible that we may even enter different speeds of, in, of, of time and duration, as there's no absolute speed thereby contracting external waves differently. So I talked about like red light, something like 400 billion fluctuations a second or something. Um, uh, it's possible that we could um, enter different speeds of time and thus get a completely different experience, perhaps explaining some very odd experiences one can have. Um, perhaps even, perhaps you could even enter the minds of other organisms um, because for those as there's no real distinction between things, um, this transference is, in theory, possible. So, um, it's, it's the ordinary, everyday consciousness that is the hallucination in the sense that it's a mere fractional, practical perspective of reality. So, taking psychedelics from this point of view is not um, a means of inducing hallucinations, but rather for our fun but rather um, escaping from the general hallucination we have that is human reality. Thank you. Let's go five minutes for any questions. Uh, I agree with everything you said. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just kidding. Um, apart from that, I'm intrigued by this idea that everything Kind of universal subjectivity, which uh, uh, I'm slightly confused. Um, how do you, what do you do with that information when I say, okay, this table is, is subjective? What are the consequences of that? How do I disprove that? And how, what do I do with that information once I've accepted it? What does it mean? Um, okay. Number one, that question implies that the knowledge should be uh, practical, which is exactly what you're talking about. Again, that is that, you know, what can I use it for? Again, being human practical bench knowledge. Um, but like I said, it's not a table that is, has subjectivity. It would be the elements within it. And that would only be for Schopenhauer, not Bozen. For, for Bozen, it would only be um, life forms that have subject, subjectivity. What can you do with it? Well, you know, not much really. But why should knowledge have a practical use? I, 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 I agree with that. But I, I, will, I will say one interesting thing I saw in the news recently. They said, um, um, Crafts apparently uh, move away from electri uh, electric uh, shocks, you know, unsurprisingly really. But anyway, they've discovered this somehow. And so a scientist came on the news and said, that means maybe we should treat crabs in a more ethical way. So I was going to say, should you sit down, you know, not hit the table as hard as you normally do? <laughs> um, <coughs> well, you know, uh, when, if, you know if, even if you're a vegan, you'll be eating organic substances. So I mean, as Nietzsche says, life itself is exploitation. So maybe the, the nature is right into the floor and that's just the way it is. Modern physics says there's 11 dimensions. Mm -hmm. There's a guy by the name of Bear who claims that out of those 11 dimensions, two, there's two time dimensions. Now here I come to Bergson who claimed there were two time dimensions in the psychological experience. Do you believe that he thought that there were two actual time dimensions? One straight and one magical. Um, well, perhaps it's his two, it's his two dimensions, the duration and, and the time, mathematical time, um, really, I, don't, I mean, I don't know enough about the 11 dimensions of, of, of space and time to comment properly. But basically, it's, 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 quantum physics say that are possibly two time dimensions, mm. one curled up along the other. Mm. And um, Alexander yeah. wrote about that, and, and Jamie Dunner wrote about it. Mm. Um, I, if your question is how compatible are they, um, I really couldn't comment, it's not really my field. Also. 
I don't know. But all I can say is, yeah, the word time, two, I, I don't know if dimension is even the right word, but you know, there's two uh, ways of looking at time, which is duration, then which is psychological, and time, and then it's the sort of physicist's time, which is on the line. And with the 11 dimensions of space, I don't know if they're taking time as a variable under that anyway, but I, I really can't comment on that. Any more questions? Yeah. When you speak of movement, I mean, it does, you said that movement exists uh, anyway, almost it has its own independent existence. I would say that surely, without time and space, it's dependent on time and space. We talk of movement, you know, you do this quite a lot. Mm. Imagine from one place to another. Mm. But without time and space, it ceases to exist. What I would say is, again, um, you know, you mentioned as well about inanimate objects not being conscious, or you don't feel that. But we have no way of knowing. The only thing I would need to decide that it's great to have that experience of being a two-dimensional object. And that feeling of that even the nature of, of existence is conscious. Not in the way we understand it intellectually, yeah. and but I, it and is I'm all sure. awareness. And so the one well, well, that second point is ultimately yeah. what you're saying is, but the first point about time, surely movements in time and space, that's exactly his point. No, it's not. Because as, what is time if it's not movement? What if, if you believe time is separate from the things within time, then the question is what no, is it? Yeah, but perception is movement. Yeah, but perception is movement. Everything you perceive is constant, constant flux. Even, even, as I say, a solid colour, of course, is movement of, of um, electromagnetism. In our conscious experience, yes. so that's all there is. Well, that's all there is while we have that perception. But like I said, well, us, but then the person point is that what you see is actually part of you, so there's no real um, distinction between them. Yeah, we have that illusion. We have that. Well, he, he argues, I mean, you know, it's debatable, of course, but he argues that, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the way, that's the very useful way of looking at reality, but ultimately it's not real. We basically mistake the model for reality.